Good morning, everybody. Thank you for attending our legal webinar. Today, speaking will be Brian Birdie, a licensed real estate broker in Texas, Missouri, and Washington, who started his property management career in his family business, Birdie Properties. Under Birdie, the 42-year-old company grew from a one-man office with 50 doors to a business of 20 employees that manages over 2,000 single-family properties. In 2008, Birdie served as the National Association of Residential Property Managers, NARPM, national president, and his industry designations include residential management professional, master property manager, the certified residential management company designation from NARPM, and the certified property manager designation from IRAM. Additionally, he's approved, he is an approved property management instructor for the state of Texas, Florida, Washington, Utah, and NARPM. Brian is currently the Director of Education and Outreach for PetScreening.com. PetScreening.com helps property managers manage residents' pets and assistance animals digitally while generating opportunities for pet-related revenue. So thank you again to Brian for giving us this presentation that I know is well sought after. So I'll let you take it from here. And just as a reminder, if you do have questions, drop that in the Q&A and we'll try to get that answered in the presentation or after. Thank you guys. Yep, since it's, hey guys, so I am uh, Brian Birdie and uh, that was a great introduction. Thank you for that. Just if you're new to the webinar setting down at the bottom where the mute and the start and stop video is, there's a question and answer bubble. If you type in your questions there, um, we will, we will attempt to get to all the questions as we go through this. In some cases, uh, we want this to be a very interactive lesson. So we may address them while we're going through, but certainly at the end, we will try to answer all of them to make sure that we are clear on what we're delivering. So today, the goal is to get a good understanding about assistance animals and the changes that happened this year in 2020. So I'm going to walk you through this, and at the end, hopefully I will have explained and answered all of your questions. I'm sure there will be more, and we will cover them. Uh, we think that this is what a pet is. Um, looking through the eyes as a housing provider, right, we know that um, tenants are going to have pets. The problem is, this is what a tenant thinks is a pet, and this is what a tenant thinks is not a pet. And that's where sometimes we have some issues and some problems. And I would say that this year, 2020, as crazy as it has been, HUD actually did us a favor with the notice and the change that they delivered to us this year. It's one of the probably the, one of the few very good things we can look back at 2020 and say actually happened. So we want to make sure that we're all very clear that an assistance animal is not a pet. And that's the biggest thing that we have to understand and recognize that we deal with basic two classifications. We have pets and what we can do with pets. And then we have the second classification now that is called an assistance animal. Now an assistance animal is an animal that works, provides assistance or performs tasks for the benefit of a person with a disability or that provides emotional support that alleviates one or more identified effects of a person's disability. The uh, prior to 2020, we were sitting out there without a lot of guidance. And as a housing provider, we're like, what can we say no to? Is this valid? How do I know? And it was very confusing. And in, in addition to that, service dogs were really covered directly under ADA. Um, we had a responsibility to it, but it didn't fall directly under HUD. HUD, who of course we wanna make sure that we understand and we follow their guidelines, um, didn't have anything out there that really clarified what was going on. And the problem was just words alone were a problem, right? What are we dealing with? Are we dealing with an emotional support animal, a therapy animal, a companion animal? I mean, we didn't even know what to call them. Nevertheless, we didn't really know how to approve or disapprove them because there was not significant guidance. Now, pet screening had been working directly with HUD and their compliance department and sharing a lot of our data so they could see what we as property managers across the country were actually going through. Um, and they decided they needed to finally do something and they came out with FHEO 2020-01, that's its formal name and it is titled HUD's Assistant Animal Notice. 
Now, this came out in January of 28 of this year relating directly to assistant animals in housing. And this is the first that HUD issued this notice to assist housing providers, that's all of us, animal owners, that's the people we're dealing with, as well as the medical providers relating to those requests for accommodations for assistance animals, starting to make a much more clear pathway as to what has to happen so that we knew what was valid and what wasn't and how to hold people responsible. Now, this notice replaced HUD's guidelines from 2013, completely replaced it. So what is out now is the, the, the rules and laws we have to follow. And so it had been seven years since they had addressed this subject. It's a pretty long time to have us. And I would say in those seven years, we have seen a massive increase in those requests around assistant animals. Now, the best thing that they did for us when they did this was they started to clarify some terminology. And they did it right in the naming of this notice. It is called the assistant animal notice. Now, all animals are either pets or they are assistant animals. Now, under assistant animals, there are three classifications that we have to understand and deal with. One of the biggest changes to this is that they pulled in the service animal underneath HUD and made it its own uh, classification of assistant animal. So we are immediately responsible to all service animals under this notice under HUD directly now. Then there are support animals. And then there's a third classification that is called unique animal. I'll address that a little later because it is so very rare. So we know when we're talking here that we're really talking about dogs. So we've done over 48,000 reasonable accommodation requests at pet screening in the last three years. I would say because of that, we are the most expertise in the subject matter. And this is the breakdown of what has come through. 91% are dogs, 8% were cats, and 1% fell into this other category of all the possibles that are out there prior to this uh, notice coming out. Now, with service animals, there's separate processes than there is with support animals. Service animals do not need written proof. There has to be a disability and the animal must be trained for a needed task. And HUD made it clear and said, this is dogs only. And then the state of California decided to change that. But we're all in Texas, so we don't have to worry about that. So as far as we go here in Texas, if it is a service animal, the only thing that fits in that category is a dog. And it has to be assisting an individual with a disability and it has to be trained. Now support animal, that's the one that was confusing everyone. The terminology that kind of took over was this ESA, emotional support animal, but people were calling it companion animals and so, you know just so many different names, but now they've made it very clear. If you are not a service animal, you are a support animal. And if you're a support animal, you have to have written proof for this need. That written proof must define that you have a disability and a disability related need for this animal. These are some of the nice changes that help us in managing this. There's no training required for a support animal. That's why it has a completely different process and they've defined what it has to be. And I'll cover that in detail in just a minute. So in the service animal, since it's kind of new and different to us, it's, it's really the very easiest of this process. And I think if we were all, look back at what we've dealt with, this was not our problem area. Service animals were pretty clear cut and they're pretty valid. Now, remember all the rules that we share today have to do with you not obviously seeing the need, right? So let's talk about this. Service animal dogs are subject to an ADA inquiry. So I could ask these questions legally and determine does this meet? So number one, is this animal required because of a disability? I'm not asking you about your disability. I'm asking, is it required because of A? If the answer is yes, what work or task has this animal been trained? Trained, that's the big one, to perform. Now that work or task in this case is not emotional support because that is not a service animal. So if they answer yes, and it has work 
or tasks that have been trained has been identified, then you should request this grant. No further inquiry or documentation is required, and they are approved as a assistance animal under the classification service animal. Now, remember, if it is visible and obvious, you, you shouldn't have to ask these things. But today, in this COVID world, we're really not seeing people the way we were. So most of the situations we're gonna deal with probably are not obvious. I guess the difference would be if a person walks in the front door, clearly blind with a seeing eye dog and comes up and says, I wanna rent from you and I want a reasonable accommodation for my seeing eye dog. You know, There isn't much need to go any further. He has a disability, he cannot see. The dog has been trained to help him see, therefore he qualifies end of discussion, right? This is the easy one. The harder one is when we get into the support animal piece, right? But they've helped us in this assistant animal notice in that the requester, we can, they, the requester has to establish in their letter that they have a disability and a disability related need. This is the positive piece of this that came out. Yes, we are now directly responsible for service animals. I don't think that's really gonna hurt us in any way. I think the benefit of this notice is really going to help us more than anything because then we can determine, does this fit into the right type of animal? Because now with this, HUD has defined what kind of animal can fit into being a support animal. A support animal has to be a commonly kept inside of households. Those are things like dogs, cats, small birds, rabbits, hamsters, gerbils, rodents, fish, turtles, other small domesticated animals traditionally kept in homes for pleasure. Remember, it may sound crazy to you, but if they come with a medical provider providing the documentation, we're going to cover a little bit more what it has to do, and it meets that level of uh, of information and need that they have a disability and the, the health provider says that this animal falling into this category meets the support um, needed for that disability, there, there's no discussion here. That will become classified as a valid assistance animal under HUD guidelines, and then we have to treat them as an animal and not a pet. Prior to this notice, there was not this definition of, of what kind of animals, and that was driving people crazy because they were calling anything they wanted to. They also didn't define those letters as well. So this is really helpful for us because now we, if it's not a, a non-domesticated animal, right? No reptiles, except for turtles, no barnyard animals, no monkeys, kangaroos, or non-domesticated animals, not considered common household pets. So clearly we've defined what we're dealing with in the service animal, dogs, and in the support animal, domesticated typical pet animals. Like at least tightened up that a little bit. Now this unique animal is the new category. There are still, we could look and say, okay, I've got everything under control. I know what service is. I know what support is. I know what I'm dealing with here but they of course have to have an exception because there are unique situations, And that's why they called it this. This is very unique. I doubt we will see it very often. It will be very, very rare, but recognize that it's there. And let's cover a couple of reasons why this happens. Reasonable accommodations may be necessary when they, there's a need for a unique animal, which involves unique circumstances. One, the animal is individually trained to do work or perform tasks that cannot be performed by a dog. For example, the monkey you saw, okay? That is a service animal that's designed to do things for that individual with a disability that's not a dog. So we're not going to call it a service animal. We're going to call it a unique animal. That's how it fits into this. There are also issues, for example, individuals who have allergies to dogs but need a service animal. If service animals have to be a dog and I'm allergic to dogs, then what do I do? So they will find other ways to provide an animal that can be trained for the task that's needed, and that won't be a dog. They will fall under this unique category. Okay. And also, and additionally, if without that animal, the symptoms or the effects of that person's disability will be significantly increased, right? Now, um, this is very unique and you'll have to deal with it. Just know you can't sit here and say, hey, it's not a service animal because it's not a dog. No, understand there is still a unique opportunity that you will have to deal with. I think it's very rare. I personally have never dealt with one. So uh, the odds of it are very you know, not very strong that you're going to run into it. Be informed that it is there. Don't step into, uh, you know, a, a problem by denying them. 
When this letter came out, it was designed in two parts. One part was designed for us, housing providers, to understand what we now can and can't do, how these things fit in, how they're defined. And then the second part, which we'll talk about in a minute, is designed for the requester and the medical provider to tell them what they have to provide to us. It's, it's great that we now have it where we can look at it, send them the HUD notice that states this. Here are the two big things they address that I think really help us. This is the power of this whole thing. There's this new word called nexus. We love this word nexus, right? It's not a new word, but it's a new word as far as us relating to assistance animals. There has to be a nexus between a disability and the need, that's the nexus, the need of this particular animal, a relationship or connection between the disability and the need for the animal must be provided. You can't just say, I need it. There has to, you know what I mean? The letter from the medical provider has to define that they believe that the need for this animal is required because of that disability. A lack of documentation may be grounds for denying a requested accommodation. It was very hard, not impossible, but much harder prior to this notice to really hold people accountable to what they were giving us. I mean, if they walked into my office five years ago with a handwritten letter in crayon, it was hard for me to say no. And so I would approve them. Today, it's very different. Um, the second one is multiple animals. It tends to be when we see someone with an assistance animal, all of a sudden they have two or three or four or six. You've heard these stories. Some of you have experienced this. This new guideline makes it very clear there must be an individual assessment of each request. Now, that doesn't mean you have to have a letter for each animal. You can have one letter, but in it, it must define the nexus for each animal and each animal must serve a distinct and different need related to the disability. So let's use a very simple example. I've got an individual who's blind and has a seeing eye dog. That's a service animal trained for a task. He needs that. He also has epilepsy and he has a service animal designed to warn him before he's going to have a seizure. Those are two distinct service animals both have a nexus between the disabilities that they have and the need for that animal. And if I were to get a letter defining this from his healthcare provider, right, stating that he needed both these animals for those reasons, then this would be approved without any problem. Many people just think they can just throw a bunch of animals on one letter and think that they can all then be support animals. You have to define for each animal the difference. This has led, this multiple animal requirement and the unique nexus that's required, this has led to holding people more accountable this year than anything else, I believe, and has led to a lot more not approved requests authorized and supported by HUD because these are their rules. This applies to all assistance animals. So if you, you, you still have to prove this, whether it is a service animal, a support animal, or even a unique animal, everyone falls under this. This is where the power of this new notice is helping us as housing providers. Now, internet providers have been the the worst part of all this, this is what really got a, out of hand. This is where they were recognizing they had a problem. If you notice what we've come up to, we have pretty much eliminated the power of these certificates. So HUD statement says certificates, registrations, licensing documentation from the internet are not sufficient. Why? Where on here does it define the disability and the disability related need for this animal? It doesn't do it. Therefore, doesn't meet HUD's requirement of proper documentation. Now, letters from legitimate licensed healthcare professionals uh, that are reliable if the professional has personal knowledge of the individual. Now, they covered this in January. So understand today, it seems like, of course, we'd have to deal with this. But I would say in January, we were all, we wanted face-to-face -face meetings. We wanted to know that this doctor or whoever met with this patient, right? Now, the intent of this rule was to focus on the personal knowledge and not the remoteness or internet source, right? We confirmed with HUD enforcement office that personal knowledge is not limited to face-to-face -face interaction. 
Well, now you throw COVID into the middle of all this craziness and nobody's seeing anybody face to face anymore. So we're all probably naturally making that adjustment. You are seeing a lot more online medical consultations and we are seeing a lot more as that being the standard but that's still providing the proper documentation. And these right here, immediately, if somebody submits that as their documentation, they are notified that it does not meet the HUD standards. We tell them what they have to go get. We don't tell them they're denied. We tell them to go get what's required. Now, in this, in the second part, there was guidance for animal owners and the medical providers, it was important that one, right, all the rules were telling us what we have to do as housing providers. They also made sure that the animal owners themselves had to understand what they have to provide. It was directed straight to the animal owners and the medical providers. It's designed to help them understand what we as a housing provider needs. And it explains to the medical provider what is needed in their documentation the provider and patient relationship, the type of animal, the disability related information, the unique animal need, that's that nexus piece, right? And the need for that particular animal and that works for each one individually. And this is very useful to help us address deficiencies or those needed information because we point directly back to this when we have to tell somebody you are insufficient in providing documentation. Here's what you really need. And we point them directly to this notice and it's up to them to go get what's needed. They're not denied, right? I would say that important part, you have to understand this notice. You probably, you can get this off the HUD website. I would read through it thoroughly if you're going to be processing this yourself so that you understand the power you have to say yes or no. Now, of course, Pet Screening believes we're the best solution because we're free. Um, that's, it's this eases and lessens disputes, right? Because you know how it is when you can blame the law, it's you you can't blame me. I'm not telling, you no. HUD is telling you, you don't have the right documentation. I'm sorry that you don't. And I can't change the rule. These are HUD's rules. That's what gave this thing so much power. We can point directly to this notice and hold them more responsible. What this has led to is an increase of quality assistant animal letters. Most of the medical profession call them ESAs still because they're still learning this piece. But we need to know the HUD is defined this as an assistance animal. And the we have seen an increase. Now, does this mean we have stopped everything and there's no more faking and cheating? No. Well, let's be realistic here. Just because we've set the rules, when you set rules, people will follow the rules and they'll be valid and people will learn how to cheat and follow the rules. But when they follow the rules and they provide everything, you have no justification to deny them. And that window is still there. I would say it is harder than ever to cheat this, but it is not impossible. So what does this really, all these changes mean to us, right? Well, the guidelines do not alter. Ryan, yes. Let me just interrupt before you move on. We sure. have a request to quickly explain that nexus one more time. Okay. Hey, let's go back to that page. So it is required that their documentation, right? Define that there is a relationship or connection between the disability that this individual has and the need for this animal. Now, let me explain what we're seeing in writing. Maybe this will help us understand a little bit better. And let's go to support animal because you know that's what we see the most. We are seeing, realize that depression, anxiety is considered a disability. And COVID has caused a spike in this in our population. And if an individual has a medical provider who's sitting there with them and says, I believe that you really are in depression, one of the things we believe can help with that is a personal relationship with this animal. And they say that we believe this animal is going to help alleviate their anxiety, their depression, um, their lack of adapting to their surroundings. Those are some of the common things we see. When they define in the letter that they have the disability and that they believe the presence of this animal is providing the needed support for that disability, that's the nexus, right? 
we might not agree with it, but we can't we can't say anything about it at that point. They provide the proper documentation that defines this nexus. That is, I need, I have a disability, and this animal is providing a required need. If we go back up to the support one where it defined what it did, including emotional support. Um, and then the multiple is just that it has to happen with each individual. So I can't be a, a blind individual with a seeing eye dog who then has a second seeing eye dog because that's two animals serving one task, right? Um, if I ha have an emotional support animal because I have anxiety and this is the animal supporting my anxiety, I don't need a second animal to support the same anxiety. But if I also have some other disability that they define and some other need for a different animal, now I've defined two disabilities, two nexuses, or if there is a way for them to find that each animal separately and on their own way provides support for the disability that I have. Um, that is what that power of nexus is. And the, it is on them and the information that went out to the owners, it tells them they have to give it to us. The medical provider has to give us the right information. We have challenged many letters. They've gone back and corrected them. Most of the medical providers out there have also gotten education on this and they understand what they have to do. And many of them have come up with you know, the format. The letters are much more formal than they used to be. Is, and that benefits us because we can start to see, you know, those that are valid and those that aren't pretty quickly. Just know that these guidelines do not alter or expand the housing provider's obligation under the Fair Housing Act, but they serve as a guide towards following the requirement of the law. Note, it, note that this was effective immediately. So this is already in place, January 28th. So we're almost a year into this. This is already in place, has been since January, and it was not retroactive. So you couldn't go back and say, I'm sorry, um, I approved you as a service or support animal, but you can't. But you can revalidate this on an annual basis. You can require anyone who wants to stay and renew their lease to go out and re-verify that they still have that need. It is not a need forever. Once classified as generally your service animals you can that have been trained because you know they still have the disability, you know the animal is still trained, that kind of has a longer lifespan because there's no documentation that has to be written. Support animal has a written letter. The, 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 the rule is that that letter is valid for 12 months. Now, during COVID, we expanded it to 18 months on approval just simply because people were having problems, but we're past that. We're back to that one year window. So the doctor has to resupport that they want to do that. When many people go back and we didn't, we didn't used to do this as a property manager. I didn't requiring my people who are in my property to go back and show me additional proof a year or two later, you're finding out the doctors do not support that decision any longer. And then that animal is no longer an animal. He's a pet if he wants to stay there. Now, we also have to look at just being fair and in this situation, I had one just last month, right? I had an individual that came to me with a bearded dragon. It's a lizard about this big, okay? As an emotional support animal, met their qualifications a year ago. They signed a one-year lease. And during their one-year lease, this rule came out. Now, the rule says very clearly, no reptiles. But here they're in my property, the emotional support animal that was approved a year ago, um, so when I had them reapply, pet screening came to me and said, hey, this doesn't fall under the new rules, but don't you want to grandfather this particular case? What do you want to do? And I'm like, I'm not going to tell them they have to turn that animal into one. I could have legally, but I chose not to. Now, if she moves out and goes anywhere else to live anywhere else with that animal, it's not going to be a, a assistant animal under the support anymore because it doesn't meet the requirement. So let's look at what we're dealing with in reality as property managers. You know that 60% of the residents come with either a pet or an animal, but only about 9% of those out there are legitimate assistant animals. There is still a massive abuse because people, one, don't know the rules, right? Or, or they are scared to challenge when someone says, I have one. 
Uh, 1.59 average household pet, uh, pets per household. And we've been watching a reasonable accommodation request skyrocket year over year. And you can imagine what COVID did to both of those numbers. If you watched closely this summer and even till today, there are kennels out there with no animals for adoption. They're empty. Okay, because pet ownership skyrocketed this year. There were more adopted animals in America than ever this summer. I guess people needed to help deliver something for their family, their kids. You know, and they had the time. They were all at home. It was easy to train them. I, you know, whatever the reasonings behind it, this is what's happened, which means now if the number was already 60% before, imagine what it's going to be after COVID. And imagine what that reasonable accommodation request might look like with all the stressors that's been going on in our world this year. Uh, this has been so bad. The only state out there that has a overage in supply of animals is Hawaii. And they've actually just connected with some organization that is funding, sending like a thousand of their animals from Hawaii back to the States to put into some of these um, kennels that have no pets so that people can adopt them. Now, we have done over 48,000 reasonable accommodation requests in the last three years. And it's important to know that many people think they have an assistant animal, but once they get into a formal process, they either themselves self-eliminate or we ask them to provide what's required and they're unable to. It's very important to know that in the last 48,000 that we did, 60% did not meet HUD's requirements, which means if you don't have a set policy and a way to go and attack the data that's coming in and you just approve them if they ask them, you're getting abused and you're losing out on potential pet revenue because pet is a, a, a premium and most people are charging for that. There's still fraud out there and we catch that here at Pet Screening, right? They will fake letterheads, alter dates, forge signatures. Um, we had a really good one just last week. The letter looked very valid. We called the doctor because that's part of the process. And she said, hey, I wrote that letter, but I wrote it three years ago and I no longer support it. Haven't seen this person in three years. Three years ago was valid. Today, not altered date, fraud. Now, once we define that, HUD says they can't go get a new letter. They can appeal our decision on that letter, but they've pretty much burnt the bridge now. They cannot abuse the system and then try to go around and get a valid letter. So um, some power behind this to hold people accountable. So real quick, before we go to questions, just so you know, Pet Screening was created to help pet-friendly housing providers understand the risk associated with renting to pets and its owners, to generate new incremental pet revenue, and to validate reasonable accommodation requests on assistance animals. We'll do that for you. It's a centralized digital platform. It monitors pets and animals across your entire portfolio. We can set this thing up and roll it out with your business in 30 minutes. No software to download. No cost to you at all. Zero ninety nine. Okay. And no contract to sign. So now we want to open up and cover some questions. Make sure we got we have more than enough time. Let's look and see what questions that we have. If you want to reach out to me directly, it's real easy. It's brian at petscreening.com. But I'm going to open up the question box and see what we've got. Uh, so we had one that says, hypothetically, we have an emotional support animal, in quotes, that's getting out of the fence, chasing and barking aggressively at neighbors, but not biting yet. But neighbors are worried they're going to. Is there anything that can be done? It's no different than them just having a dog. I would, you know, just let them know they're responsible for his actions. Do know this. If he bites someone, um, the action of biting someone will it will invalidate in the future your ability to be approved as an assistance animal. Um, in pet screening, we're able to store incidences. Property managers will put that in if that were to happen, and then that would follow that pet around. I don't think that there's anything specifically that you can do except just telling them they are responsible and to do the right thing. Does this apply only forward or can it be applied retroactively? I, I answer that no. It, 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 uh, it was not retroactive. So going forward, you can't take it away from somebody who's in, but when the renewal point comes, you can. Um, what if we have a pit bull restriction? You can have all the restrictions you want on pets, 
you cannot have restrictions at all on assistance animals. Now know this, when you, this is a fact we've been driving into this data over the last few years. It is proven the five highest approved assistance animals are breeds that everybody wants to restrict, pit bull being their favorite. The trend today is to get away from restrictions to create pet friendly that produces pet incomes and hold the, because in pet screening, each animal will get a score and you can rate them and charge them accordingly. When you tell a person absolutely no pit bulls, their only option to live in your property is to turn the pit bull into an assistance animal. And though it is harder, remember what I said, it's not impossible to follow the guidelines and get approved. Um, so just something to think about. There is no animal, a dog wise, that can be, you know, that fit into this, that'll be denied because of breed, weight, anything. You can't bring a horse or a giraffe or a peacock anymore, but if it's a dog or a cat, and they get the proper documentation and they are defined as an assistance animal, there is no stopping no matter what your rules are. If the healthcare professional uses the word service animal instead of emotional support animal letter, is the letter required to state what task the animal is trained to do? Um, if the healthcare professional uses the word service. No, here's the thing. With a service animal, no documentation. The answer comes from the individual. Is this animal for a disability? Yes, it is. Can't ask why, right? Has it been trained? What task has it been trained to perform for that disability? This animal does this for me. Boom, done. No letter required. So when you see a letter, it's generally not a service animal. It is a support animal. And so there's no definition of training of tasks. And, Brian, and can I, I jump in? Yep. I was going to add, uh, we here are getting, you know, a lesson in the different terminology between support animal, assistance animal, um, and emotional support animal. A doctor might not have that same understanding. So if they use the wrong term, <clears throat> I don't think that would be determinative of yes or no, you can't have that animal you might just need a follow-up question, but the, the doctor is not, you know, well-versed in the law. True. And you will, you will find that even if they call it a service animal, the service that it is providing is support, then the letter is still valid. Um, um, but it's not a service animal. It's a support animal underneath assistant animal. So the next one says, how do you handle pet charges for, for a pet at move-in if it's later determined to be an ESA or vice versa? The, the smartest thing to do is to determine exactly what you're doing with when they move in. So if they come to you, know what you're dealing with. Don't put someone, do not sign a lease when you don't know what you're dealing with. You should be dealing with one of two things, a pet, and you can follow the pet and use the pet addendum and do all the appropriate things and charge whatever you're going to charge or an assistance animal. And in my case, what I do on my leases is, is I list the assistant animals as an occupant in the lease next to the children. So that's very clearly not being dealt with as a, now when it changes and they come back later to change it, that's from that point going forward, if they've paid anything that you, it's not required to re-rebate it back to them, but if you were charging any monthly thing and they become a, a, a valid assistance animal, you couldn't charge it any longer. If there was a pet deposit and it becomes an ass, a assistance animal, I would return that because you're no longer holding it for a pet because you don't have a pet in the house anymore. Can you put up the percent slide again, the one that shows 1.59 average pets per household? Hold on one second. Brian, we've got a few requests for your, your slide presentation as a whole. So if you'd be willing to share that. Oh, maybe. absolutely, I would. Um, then I think we can just send that to, um, to sure. the attendees instead yep. of- I'll going send that. Back. Yep, I'll send that. You can get that. And then does this mean the doctor has to see the patient in person at some point or recent in the past? No. And before COVID, they had already defined that was in person was not required. And with COVID, you can imagine pff, that's really never going to happen. So they have to have a personal knowledge. They can do that now via Zoom. OK, uh, and they have to provide the proper documentation that we've covered today. Do we have to inform the tenant to have 
an annual letter from their doctor. Um, you can tell them that they need to come and do it. What we do at pet screening is they get a one year um, profile that they have to go back and renew every year. Um, and if it's an assistance animal, there's no cost to them either and no cost to you. So it's an easy way to track that. But yes, I would require them to go and revalidate their situation when they have an assistance animal. I also do that with pets because what you're going to find, we're finding a lot this year, assistant animals that can't be assistant animals any longer because they don't have the documentation to support it. They turn them into pets and start paying. They, they still stay there. They still live in the property. They just now pay for the right to have a pet there because it's no longer an assistance animal. Are animal deposits allowed for these categories? No, you can charge them nothing. We can't charge them to screen them. You cannot charge deposits, fees, no money. The last HUD discrimination lawsuit came out was based on them charging deposits because they said they charge everybody a deposit and they were justifying it because they would have the opportunity to get their money back. No, you have to remember, and this is why I put them in the lease under occupants next to the kids. I can't charge a kid deposit, but the kid might cause damage to the house. I cannot charge a deposit of any kind around an assistance animal, even though it might cause damage. The tenant is still responsible for the actions of their children and their animals while living in the property. But we cannot charge funds around assistant animals, no matter what category they fall underneath. Is there a relevant difference between a therapy dog and emotional support dog? And so how it would affect to deal with each other? Now, pretty much now you are either one of those three things, service, support, or unique. And I would say the biggest category is support, and that would fit all of those things. Therapy dogs, emotional support dogs, companion animals, those are all support. How many subscribers does pet screening have? Um, we have over 7,000 companies representing, pushing up on 2 million properties across the country. Um, that are using us daily to screen all of their applicants and handle all of their assistant animal requests. What if the property owner's insurance carrier prohibits particular breeds? Guess what? If they restrict a breed and it is an animal, you can't stop it. That's why I've stopped breed restrictions in my business because I don't want to force them to turn them into an animal, which means that animal still lives in the property, still has the same risk, but there's, there's no reward for the risk being taken for the owner or the property manager. The insurance company was really big on this for a while, but you've noticed that that is kind of weaned a little bit because they don't know what that animal is either. Is it an animal or is it a pet? When they see that it's there and they know they don't like the breed, we're not seeing that to be as prevalent as it was in the past. Remember, things are changing. And this is what, one of the things that has to change with it. You can put a breed restriction against a pet. You can have no breed restrictions. And the insurance company is going to have a battle if they try to cancel someone's insurance because of an assistance animal. What I tell my owners is have a conversation with your insurance right up front. Say, I'm going to be a pet friendly location. And if you have an issue, then maybe what they want to do is find a different provider who understands what it means to be a landlord. Without, uh, wouldn't a disqualified for a need be a case where you have a pet already. They tried to convert it, document logically. Wait a minute, I gotta read this one. It should be that someone first has a problem with an animal that prescribes a pet. Yeah, Mark, uh, unfortunately, right? All we can go by is HUD. If they are standing in front of you and say, I am asking for a reasonable accommodation and they provide the proper documentation to do so, whether the chicken game before the egg or not, if all the data is there, you're going to have to approve them. Uninsurable we ever covered, right? Doesn't matter. Um, if it's a, an animal, insurance is no part of this. Uh, yep. One said, would you recommend that we look at our investors and verify if they can allow dangerous breeds? I would say that today, because we're dealing with all of this, if we want to be, remember, the majority of your renters have pets. Pets, renters with pets stay longer. Renters with pets are willing to pay more. And ultimately, renters with pets on a whole don't cause much more damage than non renters without pets who are just not good renters. So when you look at all those facts, we want to make sure that we can be as pet friendly as possible. Having conversations with your landlords about their policy is probably a wise move to try to create the greatest opportunity of getting their property rented, collecting the proper um, 
fees and things to hold off the risk that's being held, right? Um, and then when it's say an animal, there's nothing you can do about all of that, but at least now you're protecting yourself properly. Who's considered a qualified healthcare professional? This can be a counselor, it can be um, a doc, certainly a doctor, a nurse, all these things. That's the, a lot of times it, it's, it's tough to go out and determine that piece of it. We, we challenge the validity of these letters often um, and very few times are we, are we really addressing the individual when they can provide that they have, um, that they are a licensed counselor. Doesn't take much to become a licensed counselor in most states. So um, they did not crack down on that as much as they did the letter they provided. I was told that if a particular SC creates an undue burden to the land court, it can be denied under, you can, that's a tough one to, to win and to fight. You can try that. It's very, very hard to define that that animal is causing an undue burden. Um, and, and the insurance letter was not going to handle. Our recommendation is that that's not a battle you're going to win as far as pet screening, the way we utilize this. And remember, we deal with HUD compliance department regularly. We've done over 48,000 of these things. We just know which battles we can win and which we can't. Can the owner get out of recognizing the letter based on its first factors? Nope. May you request to see the performed task by the service animal. I don't know the answer to that one. I will see if I can find out from uh, Brad Morris, our federal litigator who runs our assistance animal and ask if that's something we can address. I doubt it. I think written into the HUD, it is very clear. You asked the two questions and that's as far as you can go. So I, I would assume, and this is me assuming, so only take it that much that I don't think you're gonna be able to do that, but I wanna double check because I wanna know the right answer. How the heck can you verify that what a person tells us about the qualification of a service animal? That is the craziest piece of this, guys. That is the one big negative that I see as a provider. As a housing provider, the one thing this whole thing is, I love what it did to control the support part of it, but the service animal side is, is kind of wide open. So shh, let's keep that quiet. The less people know that, then the less it'll be abused. But we're gonna have to watch that very closely because. It, it is kind of like the open door they forgot to put a lock on. So uh, what if the property owner's insurance, we talked about that. If you have a fourplex that's no pets because the tenant has allergies, do you have to allow an applicant? Yep, you cannot deny them. You just have to tell the tenant to stay away from the other tenant. Fourplex still have walls, they still have their own space. Just imagine the apartment complexes who have to approve assistance animals. They got hundreds of people living around each other, right? You, there, there's no way to, to, to not do that. Uh, two animals were in the backyard. Resident claims they do not have to provide documentation of the assistance animal and threaten to sue. That's why you wanna use pet screening because you just tell them you have to go to pet screening and we'll hold them responsible. We have asked for documentation from the doctor. It's not been forthcoming. They said they'll get around to it. Recommendations? Um, tell, uh, proceed with them having unauthorized animals. That's the only action you have. Until you take an action, they're not going to do anything. Right now, they have unauthorized pets on the property. Unauthorized pets. Don't use the word animals until they give you proof and you turn them into an animal. Right now, Alexandra, you're dealing with unauthorized pets. Follow your policy and procedure for unauthorized pets until they provide you valid documentation that then turns them into animals. So in the case of refunding the pet deposit when it becomes assistance animals, what about the damage that may be caused? You have to imagine that the moment they become an assistance animal, you no longer have a pet in the house and the deposit no longer has validity behind it. And remember that assistant animal damage is just like kid damage and you can't collect the deposit for it. Me personally, safe as bet, just give them their money back and move forward. How recent must the doctor letter to be valid? 12 months is a line that we stick with. We gave a little leeway in the midst of the craziness of COVID, but I think we're past craziness of COVID. We're just dealing with COVID life now, right? So I would say 12 months is the window that we would say, hey, you need to go update this. It's more than 12 months old. Please go back and get an updated letter from your doctor. They'll bring it back if they have a valid animal. 
They won't if they don't. And then you have to deal with the fact that they no longer have an animal. Personal knowledge seems like it would require longer term relationship. Yeah, well, they're pretty vague on that. I'm sorry, but if I meet, and you think about it, I, I have a new doctor. I met the doctor during COVID this year. I, we did it on a Zoom call. Then we went and met personally. He has a personal knowledge of me, but it's pretty limited, but it meets the requirement. It's not a battle you're going to win. And honestly, guys, what we have to look at here is hold it to what you can control, which is now where do you fit? Do you have the proper documentation? And then do it. Trying to fight this in the areas that you don't like is you're never going to win it. You're not going to win this battle with the insurance. You're not going to win this with personal knowledge. And what we got rid of was we got rid of the certificate mills and the registration pieces. Those don't work anymore, right? You have to have a valid letter that defines these things. You have to have a nexus. You have to have an individual for each animal. We didn't have that before. So we're better off. And they're not going to cover everything. Does pet screening ask for an updated vet records? Yes. In pet screening, they have to put in pictures. They have to put in their vet's information, their shot records, with, and they take a picture and provide it in there. Microchip information. They have a number of affidavit questions they have to respond to. And all of that is an analyzed and you are given a score, a PAW score between one and five, which is a housing related risk score. And all that is digitally accessible to you and to the individual using it. And we screen pets, no pets and animals. And the assistant animal and the no pets are free. And the entire process for you as a property manager is free. So basically someone cannot justify two SAs. Yes, they can. They can have two uniquely different emotionally affected things that two different animals can provide support to. It is, um, I would say we are, it's not like an absolute. I think it's Ara. Um, there are uniquely different emotional situations that they could define as separate disabilities and have two animals that provide separate amounts of support. You're not going to find that as often. That is the one thing that I've seen. We have denied a lot of people on the multiples this year because they're, they're, their provider just doesn't see a need for them to have two. They were writing them before, but now that they've gotten some rules around it, they're understanding what they're defining. They would have to tell me why, and that becomes a little harder. We can place a dog in the app next to the children as long as the pet is considered a support animal. Well, let's make sure we use the right words, Al. So when you determine you have a valid assistant animal, where are you going to list it? You can't put it on a pet addendum. It's not a pet. Don't ever call it a pet. Once it's an animal, it's an animal. To me, the safest place to put the animal is in the lease under occupant next to the children. And it, you know, everyone's different. There might not be children there, but in that block saying, right? Fido, dog, two years old, maybe even the, the, maybe even the breed. Because now you are clearly listing them as a part of the family, not as a pet. It is an occupant of the property being treated with the, you know, how you should treat an animal, which is different. How long does it take pet screening to process a support and service animal application? Very good question, Angela. So when they provide all the proper documentation and fill it out correctly, we have a response back in 24 to 48 hours because we're validating the HUD requirement and then contacting the medical provider to determine authenticity of the letter. That's where we catch a lot of the problems. So if they don't provide everything, we tell them what they're missing. That of course slows the process, but that means you're holding them accountable. But generally 24 to 48 hours, and we're very good at, at staying at that number, you can watch exactly where it sits all the time. Can you charge a deposit based on weight and size? You can charge a deposit based on whatever you want. If it's a pet, you can charge fees, rent, deposits. You just set it up up front. You can make differentiations based on size, weight, whatever you want to do. If it's a pet, there's no rules there, no protection. You just have to decide what you want to do. It seems that the HUD guidelines do not help get rid of doctors who write BS letters. This is true. Um, you can still go out there and find a, um, whatever the proper word is, you know, unethical individual who has a license who basically wants to become a letter mill and that they're going to meet with you and give you the proper letter. Remember what I said, we're catching six out of every 10 that are either self-eliminating or we're eliminating them. So we're getting rid of some, not all. It's not impossible to cheat this. And there's doctors who don't care. They just want to get paid. Repeat what you just said about the open door 
putting the lock on. I missed it. Brian, I think that was uh, the conversation you had. But the about service not, animals, right? Right, not telling everybody that that kind of is. Oh, yes, thing. yes. The service animal is, as someone had kind of, a, when you look through all this, the scary part that there's a door that doesn't have a lock on it is the service animal piece because do you have a disability? Yes, I do. They don't have to prove it. Is this animal trained for, a what task is he trained for? He's trained to do this for me. Um, because it was under the ADA and they pulled it in, they didn't put any other controls around it. It's, it potentially could be scary that they could abuse this, but I have not seen that all year. But that's why I said, shh, because I don't, if we don't talk about it, maybe it won't happen. I require a photo of the pet with a standard pet. Can we require a photo? We require a photo in pet screening on assistance animals. And the justification is I need to know which one is the assistant animal. How am I going to know without, right? So in that process, and that is HUD does not have a problem with it. Therefore, if you want to require a photo, you certainly can. It also gives us the ability because I can take that report out of pet screening and send it to my maintenance guy. So he knows who he's going, what animals he's going to encounter when he gets to the property because the click of a button, they can have that stuff to their email. What if the animal is visibly aggressive towards others? Uh, would that not be a liability? Certainly. But remember, if he is, it is, we have to hold them responsible um, and call animal control if he bites someone, go through the legal process. We are not in the position to be able to stop anything here if they meet the requirements and they be classified as an assistance animal. Even if you feel like it's aggressive, he's still moving in. Now, when he does something wrong, then you got to hold him accountable for that. Can't assume he's going to do something wrong until he does. He could be scary and noisy. Now you can hold him responsible. You got to have rules around there, right? Especially in multifamily situations, they got to have rules around noise, right? Aggressive actions. And, but until they bite someone and it's an assistance animal, you don't, you don't really have a lot you can do. Are you allowed to disclose to other tenants that the animal is an assistance animal? For example, if it's a breeder type, we don't allow. Um, generally, one thing, one of the positive things that we've seen by using pet screening is that when individuals come in and everyone goes in it, they start to realize there's three classifications of people here, people who don't have pets, people who have authorized pets, then we have assistance animals. And if I see an animal here that's an unauthorized breed, they're either wrong in having it or they probably fit under assistance animal. It is not wrong to say that individual has a valid assistant animal. That's all you have to say. And, there's, and that's not sharing something you can't. That is a classification of that animal. And, that's, and then that's the end of that. And they should have an understanding of that if they've gone through a process and were asked those questions. What are your thoughts regarding evicting a resident with an unauthorized pest during COVID? I did. I had a, an individual who had, they had multiple, they had 10 unauthorized dogs in, or dogs and cats inside of their property. Um, we held them responsible to that. They would not follow through with any of the things. We took them to court here in Bear County in San Antonio, where I'm at. Um, and we won in the middle of COVID. We kicked, I think it was in July, uh, right after the CARES Act lifted, um, we won through the process. We had the, we actually went all the way to rid of possession. It was awful. They didn't move any of the, then they broke in the back door and put the animals back in the house afterwards. So wonderful. But we finally have complete control of the property and on we go. And the owner's very happy now. Of course, acquired the house with the tenant and the animals in it. I didn't put them in there. Uh, since there is no addendum for assistant animals, um, there is a there is a there's a form that talks about right there is a form out there it's not an addendum but there's an informational form how can we ensure enforce any rules about animal waste leashes vaccines notices you have to put that in your lease animal waste leases vaccines notices you have to create a pet policy make the pet policy part of your lease make them responsible to the pet policies that you write out that would cover all of that remember pet policy now animal policy do you tell them that their children are not allowed to leave waste outside? I mean, that's the problem, right? You have to look at it and say, hey, I don't have an, I don't tell you to tell your kids not to go do things outside they're not supposed to do. You have to be, you're just stuck with that. We have to assume they're going to do what's right. How does pet screening charge the tenant applicant for screening their pet 
per pet. Okay, so if you're looking at pet screening specifically, what happens is if they have a no pet, it's free. They just go and affirm some legal situations, which you can then hold them accountable to. If they have an assistance animal, it's free. They give you all the data. We process it. We give you a recommendation, approved or not, depending on what happens. Um, if they have a pet, that's the person who actually pays something to pet screening to process it. They pay 20 bucks for their first, 15 for any additional, and then annually, it's only 10 bucks. So it's very low, gives you the ability to have the entire thing working for you. No cost to you ever. No setup cost, no operational cost, nothing. Uh, I require a current photo with its owner, whether it's a pet or not, because I received an app with a 15 pound dog when I moved in, it was a 50 pound dog. It's requiring an animal with, the, with their owner in it, okay. We don't require that. We don't require the owner to be in with the animal. We require a side by side shot. Generally, it allows you to determine size and a front shot so you can really get a good uh, see width and see their face. And we don't generally have people requiring someone to take a picture of themselves and give it to you could lead to problems, I think. And since we're not building that into our system, you know, I don't know that there's a lot that says you can't do that, but people got problems with you having pictures of them. So just know that we have had issues showing homes for rent and making repairs due to the animal kenneling or removal or what's the best solution. Yeah. If they have, Oh, an animal, they still have to be, when it comes to time to showing, they have to be there to secure the animals, right. To kennel them or remove them. Um, you have to give them pretty much all those options, right? Whether it's an animal or a pet, the property during a period, whatever your lease says, they have to make the property available for showings. Now, I've got COVID made me get completely away from that. I do not market homes anymore. And I've done it for 20 plus years. I always market in advance. Now, because of COVID, it just does, there's too much risk around all this. I don't market anything till it's vacant. And with the CDC moratorium, you don't know that the person's ever going to move out. So how can you really rent something? I mean, this is separate for pets, but let's just be real here, right? How can we really rent something out if we don't know we have possession of it? So- I made a major policy change in my business that I don't market a house until I have physical possession of it and it's empty because that started during CARES. It's continued during, during the CDC moratorium. And you know, guys, it's coming, right? Anybody who hadn't paid rent that's holding off for January 1, is, they're all going to get evicted in January. I don't think the government's going to let that happen. So get ready. Something's coming. If a bright Oh, if a bite history comes up on assistance animal, is it okay to deny? We had that case. We took it straight to HUD and HUD told us it was okay to deny because of past aggressive actions to another human. And we did deny them, but we had written proof and we're able to track it. So make sure one is saying, you know, you can deny that two is you better be able to prove it. Why do you have applicants without pets do the screening? Does this assist you in the court eviction for non-authorized pets? Primarily, we do it for consistency, Molly. We have figured out, and remember when we first built pet screening, we only did pets and animals and that was it. But we realized there was a huge void. You can't be consistent in your procedures of your application if you don't send everybody there. One of the things we wanna do is we wanna screen everyone. So when you tell a person with the reasonable accommodation that they have to go to pet screening, it's what everybody does. So it's not unreasonable. Second is you want, we have seen a massive increase in compliance from the no pet people because they now recognize, remember person with no pet doesn't even think about pets or assistance animals or any of those rules, but now they've come on and they've established in writing through a third party that they'll be held responsible for their actions. What we have found is a massive increase on compliance. And yes, you've got some serious power to take them and hold them accountable for the unauthorized pet that you find. Six questions, they fill it out, no time flat, cost them no money, gives you all the power. What are the two questions that you can ask a tenant with a service animal? Um, is this animal needed for a disability? Yes. What is the task this animal is trained to do? And it basically has to service the disability. Now, remember, there are valid. There are 
people that will tell diabetes that their blood sugar is getting out of whack. They'll tell epileptic individuals they're about to have a seizure. They're seeing eye dogs. There's people that will go retrieve things and open things and pull them in the wheelchair and seeing eye, right? There are a lot of valid service animals, but they do have to be trained to perform a task for an individual with a disability. Can a person stand in front of you and lie to your face? Yes. Are we seeing that happen? Not in excess but it is the scary piece that I just sit and wait to see, is this gonna be abused? Now, once it happens, realize what has to happen. It has to be abused to the extreme. We complain to HUD, HUD recognizes they didn't put any restraints around it. They have to react to it and that's government and they don't move fast. So that's why I hope it doesn't happen. How would you handle approved animals in an HOA if the HOA has animal restrictions? Many of the HOAs who went out and put animal restrictions have been taken to court and have lost. So animal restrictions in HOAs um, are a little bit tougher. Um, remind them you can apply them to pets. You cannot apply them to assistance animals. I would tell the HOA, I'm sorry, you can have whatever restrictions you want, but your restrictions can only apply to pets. And this isn't a pet. It is a valid assistance animal. If you have a problem, call HUD because I have no choice but to move this animal into this property. End of, end of story with them. Wow. Brian, those are all the questions. Thank hey, you so much. we got to them all and almost stayed within our hour. So guys, if you, um, if you have more questions, feel free to reach out to me about this or problems. This is what I do. My job as director of education outreach is to make sure, and I'm a Texan, so I can talk specifically about you and your business. We love sharing and helping people go. If you want more information about pet screening, reach out to me. And if you're running into any kind of problems in this area, we feel like we're the experts. We would love to be helpful. Thank you so much for your time today, Brian. This was a very informative presentation. I mean, just looking at the chat, we have so many members that are grateful for this presentation. Um, Let me just add one so more thing since I have the audience that's out there. If you would like to bring this back to your local board and have this presented, because I know I can only reach so many people on any given date, we're very interested in providing this information, especially across Texas, and we can do it virtually. And since it's Texas, if you guys ever get to the point of doing you know, actual classes again, we'd be glad to do that. But we would love to bring this to the local boards and extend that reach because we know this is a problematic and people can get themselves in trouble simply because they just don't know the rules. So we want to share the rules with them. All right. Thank you so much, Brian. I'll work with you on getting these slides and then we can send them to all the attendees today. Sounds good. Um, as well as the recording. If you have any other questions, please feel free to message either Brian or myself. And thank you and have a great weekend and Thanksgiving holiday. Yes, thanks everybody. Bye-bye.